Hey, this is Scott, and today I'm going to talk about why I changed from Nikon to Canon. Alright, so if you're not following me on social media, please check me out, Scott Dumas Photography, on either Facebook or Instagram. Before we get into this, I just want to say this is my personal reasons for changing to Canon. It's definitely not a bashing Nikon video. I loved my Nikon cameras. It was really hard to let them go. But for me personally, Canon works better, and here's why. All right, first off is color. Everybody always talks about that famous Canon color. And while, of course, Nikon files can also be photoshopped or processed in Lightroom or something to get whatever end result you want, it took more time for me. The JPEGs straight out of the Canon cameras look fantastic for me. I haven't even taken my camera off of auto white balance since I got it and the pictures are 90% of the time very, very close to what I would want them to be, even if I did a lot of post-processing. That's not something I could do with a Nikon camera. So somewhere with a lot of control uh, in the studio, a uh, planned photo shoot, I could use the color checker passport, and of course this wasn't a problem. But when I didn't have that control, like a wedding where the lighting is always changing, going inside, outside, under mixed lighting, um, going out with my family on vacation. These are situations when using a color checker passport wasn't always practical. Those situations post-processing would just cause me a huge headache and with the Canon files I don't have to worry about that most of the time. Especially for family shoots or something it's not it doesn't have to be perfect so I can just pull the JPEGs out of the camera put them up on Facebook and I'm good to go and I can enjoy using the camera more freely without having to worry about the color balance or green shift or something like that. It's just a lot of time saved. And of course, when I'm post-processing studio shots or anything else, it's closer to the end result that I want, and so it does save time in those situations as well. All right, reason number two. This is tethered shooting. Naturally, both Nikon and Canon can shoot tethered, but with Nikon, for some reason, you can't save to the card while you're shooting tethered. Canon you can. Now this is good for a couple of reasons. One is that you can preview the picture on the back of the screen if the computer is not really close to you. Um, of course for detailed checks you're going to go to the computer. That's the purpose of shooting tethered. But when you just pop 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 shooting you want to take a quick look. It's on right on the back of your camera. You don't have to walk all the way over to the computer every time you want to take a quick look at that. And now it's also, of course, good for backup. Now, it was not an easy thing to do to automatically backup while shooting tethered while using Nikon. But with Canon, it's writing to the cards as well. So you have that backup just in case anything happens. Where, especially with USB 3, I was often losing my connection with the D810. I used the power pack or booster pack, whatever it's called, from Tether Tools. But I will always remember uh, shooting my son's entrance ceremony uh, pictures and I had set up beforehand and I didn't realize that my computer had gone to sleep when I started shooting and I was shooting for about 10 minutes with a three-year-old kid and I went to my computer, I had fallen asleep, but since the booster pack was still connected to the camera, the camera thought it was tethered, but the computer didn't save any of those pictures. and. I lost about 10 minutes of shooting. With a three-year-old, you can imagine how hard it was to get him to pose one more time after 10 minutes of pulling that patience out of him. It was not a good process. Thankfully, it was my own son, and I was able to get some good pictures, but I will always remember that nightmare, where with a Canon, it would have been writing to the card the whole time, and I would have had that back up. All right, reason number three, usability. Now, this is hugely preferential and will differ from me to anybody else, pretty much. But for me, the layout, the buttons, the features of the Canon camera system is really a good fit for my shooting style. I love the dial on the back. I love the layout of the buttons in general. The new 5D Mark IV has a touchscreen, which is fantastic. It has dual pixel autofocus in live view and in video. It has face detection, which I'm using to record this video right now and it just makes everything a whole lot easier. So just touching on a couple of those points, 
The spot autofocus is really great um, when you're trying to focus in an eyeball or even if you're doing some really close up, not quite macro photography, but close up photography where you wanna use autofocus but you wanna focus on a really, really specific point, the spot autofocus is a really nice feature. The general layout of buttons, as I said, is great not only for shooting but also for a menu navigation. Um, being able to use the top wheel and the back wheel to navigate through the menus makes it really, really quick. And of course, the 5D Mark IV with its touchscreen, which is also functional in the menu system, it's just lightning fast to change any settings, to format your cards, to do anything you want to do right there on the back screen. Some people complain that the Mark IV doesn't have a tilting screen to really benefit that touchscreen when you're shooting up high or shooting down low. I agree it could help, but I like a body without a uh, flip screen, so for me, it's not a problem. In comparison, I really dislike the D-pad on the Nikon bodies. Um, it was just not very smooth to use for me personally. Some of the bodies have a joystick, like the D4S and the new uh, D5, D500, I believe, has the joystick on the back, and that's better, but it's still not as smooth or as fast as using the knobs and the wheel on the Canon camera system when you're navigating through the menu. Speaking of the little joystick, not all Nikon bodies have that. It's on the Pro Sports or whatever bodies, like the D4, D4S, D5, and I believe also on the new D500. But on the D810, on the D750, we only have the D-pad. And so even for selecting autofocus points, that was just really clunky for me. I really prefer to have that little joystick. The 5D also has that joystick, which is really, really nice for me. One other small feature is the beep when you're using manual focus. Now, with Nikon cameras, it doesn't seem to be possible. Could be wrong, but I could never figure out how to do that. But with the Canon camera system, you can have it give you the autofocus. It's not autofocus, but the confirmation beep when you're using manual focus, which is really nice. Nikon, of course, has the little mark in the bottom corner, but that means you have to take your eye away from the focus point to check if you're in focus. But especially when hand-holding, that means you're probably going to move the focus point and it won't be accurate anyway. So just to be able to hear that beep when you're in manual focus is a really big help with the relatively small viewfinders of DSLRs. All right, the next reason is lens selection. Well, both Nikon and Canon have some amazing lenses and many of them are very comparable. There's some things that really pulled me towards Canon. I'm a big prime shooter and of course, Canon has the 1.2 primes. They also have the 135 f2 modern autofocus prime, which is one of my favorite lenses. It's what I'm recording on right now, actually. And for Can uh, Nikon, I was always a little bit not perfectly satisfied, especially with that focal range. The 105 and 135 f2 DC lenses are they give amazing pictures, but they're not as fast, especially for autofocus tracking, when I want to use them with my kids that are always running around or pretty much any mo high speed motion situation. The new 105 f1.4 looks gorgeous, um, but a lot of people say it gives a little really flat picture, so I don't know about that. It's also maybe not fast enough autofocus for sports. I'm not sure, I've never had hands on with it. Um, but it's also insanely expensive. The 135 F2 from Canon is really affordable, especially if you can find a good copy used, which I did. So that was one of my first lenses that pulled me over to Canon. Of course, the 50 and 85 1.2 are something that Nikon just doesn't have in a modern lens. And I personally got the 85 1.2. I love it. It's a little bit slow to autofocus, but it's a portrait lens specifically. And for that purpose, it is more than enough. And it gives a very unique picture. I love it. I loved the Nikon 85 1.4 as well, but there's just a little something special about that 1.2. Now going over to the 70 to 200, I don't use that much, but if you're gonna compare, the 70 to 200 from Canon doesn't suffer from the same focus breathing as the Nikon version does. 
I've heard rumors that the Nikon version will be updated soon, and I'm sure that it'll be one of the issues that they, that they fix in the newer version. But for now, the Canon version seems to be the superior lens, if only by a little. One other small point about lenses is, uh, while Nikon's 1.8G lenses lens series is really, really great quality-wise, image quality-wise, the build quality always bothered me. They felt extremely cheaply made, even the ones that are not so super cheap. And the focus ring especially felt like cheap plastic rubbing on cheap plastic. There was always a little bit of play in the focus ring. Um, and just the build generally didn't make me feel confident. Um, but the cheaper lenses, especially the STM lenses from Canon, the 40mm 2.8 Pancake, the new 50 1.8 STM, that whole cheaper lens series, to me, feels better made. I don't know if they actually are or not, but they feel better made. And also the focus ring, it's focused by wire, but it's just beautifully smooth and there's no play. It's a wonderful focus ring if you want to use that. It's small, of course, but it's very smooth. So for me, using some cheaper lenses when I'm out with my family, I didn't feel like I was sacrificing build quality. And of course, the image quality is also on the same level almost as those 1.8G lenses from Nikon. Also, one more point about the lens selection from Canon is that they have, in my opinion, a better selection of wide-angle zoom lenses. Uh, they have the newer 11-24 f4, which is just extremely wide. Um, they have something wider than that, that's I think technically a fisheye. Uh, they have a few different versions of the 16-35, to 35, both f2.8 and f4 with image stabilization. And they're all of a very nice quality. Now the Nikon 14-24 to 24 is probably still a little step above those quality-wise, but for selection, availability, variety, Canon wins hands down. Um, and almost all of those lenses for Canon can also take filters. They're smaller, they're lighter, and for me, more practical to use than a huge lens with a giant front element that I'm always worried about damaging, a lens cap that I don't have confidence that will stay on. Even the 11 to 24 from Canon, I believe, has clips on their lens cap, which is a slide-on lens cap similar to the Nikon 14 to 24. So it feels a little bit more, I mean, it's only a lens cap, but it's just those small details that for me seem nicer as far as selection and usability goes. All right, so I've been talking about Canon, 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 but here are some things I do miss about Nikon. First, of course, is everybody seems to be talking about is the dynamic range. The 5D Mark IV, of course, brought that gap a little bit closer, but still the D810 was king, and the D750 is also really great in that area. But for me personally, I don't push my files a lot. I don't underexpose. I don't bring up my shadows that much. So again, for me personally, the dynamic range of the D810 was largely wasted. So it's kind of a non-issue for me. Nikon's 3D tracking is just wonderful. It works flawlessly. It'll track small details like eye, for example. It is very smart, very, very, very good. And while Canon's tracking system and autofocus system in general maybe has more customization, the 3D tracking of the Nikon system is something that I miss. Again, that being said, Canon is good enough for me 99% of the time, so it's not something that's holding me back from moving over to Canon. Now this may be a small detail, but the autofocus points in the viewfinder on Nikon are always lit up. With Canon, they're not. So sometimes you'll be searching for where your AF point is, and if you move it, it'll light up when you move it, so you can find it just by moving the joystick a little bit. But there are times when you put it up to your eye and you can't immediately find where your autofocus point is. Um, the 5D Mark IV, at least, I know will often blink the red light in uh, low light situations automatically. So maybe it's a little step up from the Mark III. But still, it's 
I don't know why. It's a simple, simple thing to just keep them constantly lit up. I don't know the reason for it. Maybe there is, but I'm sure it's not a good reason. I just wish that in the future, I don't know if it's a firmware update that's possible or if it needs to wait for the next Mark V um, and maybe four or five years from now. But that's something that I wish Canon did. The next feature is one that I actually haven't tested, but I was really looking forward to having on future Nikon bodies, and that's the automatic AF fine-tuning feature. It seems to be really seamless, really quick, painless, and probably accurate compared to the kind of trial and error autofocus fine-tuning that you have to do with the older, not so old, but the current and older generation Nikon bodies and the Canon bodies as well. Um, now that being said, I don't know if it's just personal experience or if it's a kind of system-wide thing, but while I did need autofocus fine-tuning on almost all of my Nikon lenses, I haven't needed it on a single Canon lens yet, and that's buying all used lenses. Like I said, this could be just unique to me, but for me, every lens I put on my Canon camera has been perfect from the get-go. While we're talking about small details, there is one more small detail, and that's that the 24 to 70 f2.8 lens of Canon has the hood that attaches to the front of the lens, which extends when the lens extends, and you can see the lens extending. The Nikon version attaches to the barrel, much like the Canon 85 1.2, while the lens itself extends inside of the hood. And so from the outside, it doesn't look like the lens is actually extending, it's not only an aesthetics thing, I just like the fact that you don't physically have the actual size change while you're zooming and, and zooming out the lens. It's a small detail, but just it was something that I liked about the Nikon 24-70. Although, truth being told, I don't use the 24-70 anymore. As I said, I love primes, and if I have a zoom, it's either a very wide-angle zoom or the 70-200. to because there are situations where those things are necessary for me. 24 to 70 range, I can often satisfy with either a 35 prime or a 50 prime or even 85 prime. It is outside of that range, but it's close enough. So please let me know what you think in the comments below. How do you feel about these two systems, the pros, the cons, how they compare to each other? And of course, if you want to see more videos from me in the future, subscribe. And also, please check me out on social media, Scott Dumas Photography. Thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you again.